Today's topic is loops. What a loop is, is a programming construct that exists in every programming language. And the reason to use loops is if you have a piece of code that you want to repeat many times, or it doesn't have to necessarily be many times, but it's a piece of code that you want to be able to repeat. So if you think back to the first day of class, I told you that computers are not smart. They don't do a lot of thinking for you, but what they're really good at is uh, taking care of tedious and repetitive tasks. So one tedious and repetitive task is writing code, it turns out. So um, you know, writing some of the code is interesting and fun, but if you have to keep writing the same piece of code over and over again, that loses its luster real quick. So um, that's where loops come in. Then you can take the same piece of code and repeat it over and over again. So loop, take a piece of code, and repeat. That's what it's for. So let's do a little example. So to do this example, we'll kind of start off, I'll give you some of the requirements for uh, a loop. Every loop is going to start with the word for. I should say every for loop is going to start with the word for. There's another kind of loop, it's called a while loop, and we're going to probably not get to that this semester. That's typically something that's gets pushed off to 3,800. So I'll mention it now and a couple of other times. Um, but for now, we'll stick with for loops. So the first thing is the word for. They all start with the word for. They all end with the word end. So I told you a long time ago, end is a pretty important piece of the puzzle because everything ends with end. OK. Once you start with for, now the next thing you're going to do is you're going to define a variable. You can call it whatever you want. Um, I usually call it something short. I usually call it I, in fact, which turns out could get me in trouble if I ever start dealing with complex numbers. But if you're not dealing with complex numbers, I is a perfectly good variable name. So you define a variable, and then you're going to set it equal to a range of values. For example, 1 to 10. Um, well, let's be very general about this for a second here. I wonder why that's not erasing. There we go. Okay. So you define your range of values with your start, your increment, and your finish. These are the same kind of range of values that you would set. Um, you know, when we were talking about ranges of values when we were back when we were starting to deal with matrices, this is the same type of range of values. You define your start, your increment, your finish. The increment is by default going to be one. So if you, hold on, let me make a better looking one here. Okay, so if you want your increment to be one, you can leave off the increment completely. Um, if you want it to be something other than one, then you need to specify what it is. I find that probably 99% of the time, my increment's one, so I almost never use it. So you could set up your, uh, you can set this up, just say one to 10, for example, if that's how you want to make it work. Um, inside the for loop, you can have any code you want in here. Whatever you do inside of your for loop is just going to get repeated however many number of times you set your for loop to repeat. Each time it repeats, you're always going to have this variable available to you. And that variable is going to uh, be going through this range one number at a time. So let's set this up as a little example. So this is the general version of what a for loop is going to look like. Oh, that was cool. I'm going to clean it up a little bit here. So just a couple of notes. Default is one. I did kind of a cool thing with my my capital D. 
So this uh, whiteboard program I'm using, it's got a cool feature where it fixes shapes just to kind of make things fun. So if I draw a triangle, it'll make a real triangle, which is pretty neat. Anyway, okay, so that's our general uh, generalized for loop. Okay. So now let's do an example. We'll do a really simple example of what a for loop can do here. We're just going to count to 10 and display the numbers to the screen. Um, if you have not fired up MATLAB, I suggest doing so now. If you do not have MATLAB available to you uh, while you're in class, I would suggest getting it if you can. Um, you know, if you're working on your personal laptop, you can get MATLAB for free uh, through the campus as long as you're still a student. So I strongly recommend getting MATLAB, getting it installed. Um, if not, no, don't do it right now, but you want to do that before the next class for sure. Um, so you can follow along with this example as we, as we go here. We're going to go from 1 to 5 instead of 10. So this is a very simple for loop here. All this is going to do is it's going to uh, display on the screen all the numbers from 1 to 5 in order. I'll show you. Okay, so I'm just going to put this for loop I just wrote on the board up on the screen here. Okay, so if we go ahead and run this, um, I'm going to switch over to the other screen here. Uh, and we'll give that a run. Uh, so what it's going to do is just print i equals 1, i equals 2, i equals 3, i equals 4, i equals 5 on the screen. So let's go back to the board, and we're going to kind of walk our way through this one piece at a time. So here's how this is going to work. Uh, this is okay, sorry, had a little microphone issue there. Um, here's how these work. Let's put this out of the way here. There's a little room there. So whatever code you're running before you get here, you're going to run all the commands that you have before you get to your for loop. Then you get to the for loop. So what's going to happen when you get to the for loop, you first run this line. And what this line is going to do is it's going to start, um, what this line tells MATLAB is the following code is going to get repeated, and we're going to keep track of i each time you go through the code. So the first time through, i is going to equal 1. Then it's going to run this line of code that's inside the for loop. In this case, the line is just display I. So it's going to display I equals 1 on the screen. Okay. Then when it finishes running that line, it gets to the end. And what the end is going to do when it reaches the end of the for loop, we're going to go back to the beginning of the for loop, and we're going to check what I is. So the first thing that happens is I is going to increment now and become uh, I equals 2. So now, this is still within the range. So the range is 1 through 5. So 2 is inside that range. So we're still going. So we're going to go back into the for loop, and we're going to run this command again, display i. In this case, it'll display i equals 2 on the screen. When we get to the end here, when we see end, we're going to go back to the beginning, increment i one more time. So now i is 3. And then we're going to go back into the for loop here. We'll go back into the for loop, and we're going to run this command display i again. So we'll run this command again. It's going to display i equals 3. After that, it gets to the end, and it's going to repeat again. So we'll swing back to the beginning. It's going to increment now. i is going to be 4. And then we run again. We display i equals 4. We run 
our command again. And then after that, let's see, where are we, where are we for colors here? It's going to go back to the beginning, increment i again. Now i is 5. So MATLAB already knows that this is the last time, because now i is equal to 5. So it's going to run the command again. It'll display i equals 5 on the screen. And then when it gets to the end, if it's on the last number, the last time through i, then it's done. It'll go continue to whatever, whatever code and commands you have after that. So in this very simple example, all we're doing is displaying the numbers one at a time as we go through it. Any questions on that so far? So that's a very simple thing you can do with it. Um, there are far less simple things that you can do with a for loop. Um, just as an example of something that's very not simple, uh, let's say you have a weather prediction model, uh, something like the uh, North American mesoscale model that they use to generate the weather forecasts that you see on the news. Uh, the model they use for that is a, it's called the weather research and forecasting model. Um, and the way that works, it's thousands of lines of code that are used to advance a model one time step. So they use these thousand lines of code basically to uh, go from a starting time, like say right now, to the next time, maybe a minute later. And they'll run this, um, these thousands of lines of code to get from time equals 2.15 PM to time equals 2.16 PM. Now, obviously, a weather forecast needs to go further out than one minute. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth very much. So they need to do that over and over again. So it goes from 215 to 216, then 216 to 217, et cetera. The whole 100,000 lines of code is wrapped up in a for loop that starts with uh, time equals t, or t equals 1, and goes to t equals, I think it runs out six hours. So that's another use for a for loop. The entire code is wrapped in a for loop. So uh, going back to up here, our general example, for that case, our variable might be t. In fact, I'll write out a little short version of that right here. For t equals 1 to, uh, I'll call it 6 hours. Don't try to type this into MATLAB and run it. This is going to cause you a problem. Inside your for loop, the code in here is the whole model called WARF, Weather Research and Forecasting. So it runs this model over and over again and loops through it. That's why it's called a loop, because you keep going through it over and over again. So I'm obviously not going to write out 100,000 lines of a weather, a weather forecasting model, but OK, so looking at our code here, the way I've got this set up right now, I've got it set up so we're starting at 1, going to 5. So when we run this, um, I already did run it, but I'll run it one more time just to, just to be sure here. Um, OK, so if I run this again, I'll just give it a quick run again. Counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So if I go back to the um, other screen here, we can change what the numbers are going to be. So if I run it, instead of running 1 through 5, I go run 1 through 50. So now I change the end part. We can switch back over to the other window. We can run it again. This time, it's going to count all the way up to 50. So that's cool. Um, other things we can do with it. Okay, switching back and forth here. Other things we can do with it, we can go 1 to 5. We could also start somewhere else. So we could go from, let's say we want to go from uh, 10 to 15. We can start at 10 instead of 1. So if we run that, and feel free to be following along in MATLAB if you like. There we go. So now we're counting 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Other things we can do with it. 
You can also supply an increment. So here I'm going from 10 to 15. My increment's automatically going to be 1. Um, if I want my increment to be something other than 1, I can do that as well. So let's say I want my increment to be 2. So I go 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Let's go to uh, 24. Not 124. That's going to take too long. So I'm going starting at 10, incrementing by 2s, and going to 24. So we can try that now and see what that does. See, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. So you have many options there, um, ways you can set that up. Um, one thing to be careful of, particularly when you're using this for for loops, is it's not recommended to do this using numbers that are not integers. So if you start at 1, you don't want to do, you'll go by 0 0.5s up to 5. It might work, but it might, it might get you in trouble later. Okay, yeah, it will work. The problem with that is oftentimes you're going to use your for loop to generate an array index. An array index must be a whole number. So you got to be careful how you set your increments and how you set your start and finish, especially if you're using this to go through an array. So let's talk about how we would do that. This is our very simple example here. Next, we're going to have um, still a simple example. But this time, I'm going to set this up so we're going to go through and display the values in an array. So we'll create an array here. If you're typing this as you go, you can put in whatever numbers you want in here. I'm just going to make them up as I go. I like to put seven numbers in there. So that's going to be our array. Now what I want to do is display each number in that array individually. So I'm going to do that with a for loop. So all for loops start with four. Then we define a variable. You can name your variable whatever you want. I'm going to call it variable because I can call it whatever I want. Now I'm going to go through seven of them because there are seven numbers in this array. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I'm going to go through all seven of them, and now I'm going to display each value to the screen. Okay. I'm going to make this a little simpler. So all this is going to do is it's going to display each value to the screen. So things I want to point out here. This variable that you define, whatever you happen to name it, I named it variable. This is a number that you're going to have available to you all through the for loop. This is going to be your uh, kind of your, I like to think of it like a GPS for you as you're going through your for loop. It's always going to tell you which, uh, which loop you're on, how many times through. So if this is going through seven times, variable is always going to tell you which one you're on. So if you're going through the first time, variable is going to be 1. If you're going through the second time, variable is going to be 2. If you're going through the third time, it's going to be 3. If you're going through the sixth time, it's going to be 6. So the number, whatever variable is, is always going to be the uh, current value, or the, the, the current um, cycle through the variable. Here, we're using that variable again. So it's the same variable name. That means it's the same value. So the first time through, we're going to be looking at A1. Second time through, we're going to be looking at A2, etc. The last time through, it'll be A7. Now, when you uh, put a variable up on the screen, just uh, type out the name of the variable with no equal sign, no nothing. It's just going to display the value on the screen. So let's go ahead and switch over to the, the uh, window that runs things and run it and see what this does. So 
If you're following along, you should be able to see both of these at the same time. Okay, so if you cross-reference the numbers that you see displayed on the screen with uh, the values of A, and actually I'll just print A on the screen here so we can see that, it should be the numbers in A in order. So 8, 6, 2, 9, 10, 25, and 1. So the for loop went through and it went to each of those values. Let's go back here. So the for loop goes through here and goes to each each number starting at one, ending at seven, and inserts it into this location here and uses that to display the number that's at that part of the array. Okay. So what we're doing here, I just showed you a way to go through a vector, any kind of one dimensional array and look at each individual value within the array. All right, I'm going to make this a little more fancy. I'm going to show you some cool tricks you can do. So if we're going through an array, if we want to start at the beginning, and usually under most circumstances, you're probably going to start at the beginning of the array. Of the array. Not always, but a lot of the time, you're going to want to start at the beginning. So 1 is the beginning, not 0. If you make this a 0, now you're going to be in trouble. Because if you make that a 0, you're going to be making zero an array index. And as we know, all the array index, all, all arrays start with one. So zero is out of bounds. So you don't want that to be zero. One's a good place to start. For the end, this is going to be the end of whatever your array is. So if I change out this array to something else, let's say I make it uh, So now it's, how long did I make that? One, two, three, four, five. Now it's got 10 elements in it. Now I have to go through here and change this to a 10. Chances are, if you're me or anything like me, you're going to be a little bit lazy. You don't want to go through and change everything. You change your array. You just want to be able to hit run and let the thing go. So I'm going to show you how to do that next. You can use the length command to find how many values are in A. And then instead of saying 10 here, you can put n there. So now this for loop is going to start at 1 and go to whatever n is. So we set n here by looking at the length of a. So in that way, if I change this, if I add numbers to it or remove numbers from it and then hit run again, this is going to figure out how many values are in a no matter what. I don't have to change anything except the values in a if I want to make changes. And then this for loop is going to go from 1 to n. So it's going to go through whatever the length of a is. So I don't have to make any changes there either. So I've made this code a little more universal now by using this length command to populate n and then using n as my limit for the array. So let's flip back to the command window here and we'll give this a run. And we'll see what that does. So now it prints all the numbers. Just as a reminder, here's what was in A. So it prints out all the numbers that I put in there. Now if I go back to my code. OK, so when I ran this, and we can see A now. When I ran this over here, it printed all the numbers. Now if I take a few numbers out, let's take out this one and this one. Now if I run it again, which I don't want to see LC. I want everybody to be able to see this. Okay, now if I run it again, now it just it prints the same, it prints the numbers in order, but it didn't have to make any other changes except the actual values in my array. Okay, so again, we're just displaying numbers on the screen. That's not necessarily a particularly useful activity. So what I want to do next is I want to show you uh, something that's going to be useful probably for the rest of the time you're dealing with MATLAB, especially in class. This is something that if you take me, if you take my 3800 class, this is going to be on the first quiz in 3800. So you'll want to write this one down. I'm going to go back to the board to start going through it. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to calculate the sum of the values 
in any one dimensional array or a vector. And by any vector, I really do mean any one dimensional array this is going to work for. It. So um, here's how we're going to do that. Now, first of all, there's a built in command in MATLAB to do this. Uh, if you were to want to use a different programming language besides MATLAB, you might not have a built in command. So I want to teach you how you're going to do this using a for loop. And this is actually exactly how the built in command of MATLAB works as well. So we're basically, we have a black box that calculates a sum built into MATLAB. I'm going to show you what's under the hood there, what's inside the black box. Okay, so we have some vector. You can call it anything you want. I'm going to name it A. I'm going to put the same values in it that we had on the screen earlier. So that's our A matrix. Now we want to find the sum of that A matrix. OK, so the first thing we're going to want to do just like we did before, we want to figure out how big that matrix is. That way we can change the size of it whenever we want. So we're going to figure out what n is. Use the length command to find n. I would suggest suppressing output. I usually don't on the screen just because it muddies things up a bit. But you want to suppress the output for pretty much everything. OK. Now what we're going to want to do with this, we're going to want to walk through our A matrix. And we want to add up everything in there. So we want to add 8 plus 6 plus 2 plus 9 plus 25 plus 91 plus 34 plus 56. We want to go through and do that. We want to do that in a systematic way so we don't have to, you know, that's not such a, a big deal when we have 8 values. But when we have 800 values, we don't want to go through and do that by hand. So that's what this is going to be for. Speaking of 4. We're going to start off with a for loop. I'm going to go from 1 to n. Inside that for loop, we're going to go visit every single value in this vector. Now, what we want to do, so we got to come up with a little strategy here, how we're going to go through and do that. So we're going to go through, and we're going to start off, we're going to go to 8. Then we're going to add 6 to 8, so we're going to have 14. Then we're going to add 2, so we'll have 16. Then we'll add 9, so we'll have 25. And then 50. And then etc. We'll keep going through all of these. So we're going to start off before we got to 8. Before we got here, we had 0. Now we have 8. Now we have 14. Now we have 16. Now we have 25. Now we have 50. So, but we got to start off at 0. So before we even start walking through anything, we want to start ourselves off at zero. So we'll call this our total, and I want to make it zero. Now, inside my for loop, now I'm going to start accumulating values in that total. OK, so this line right here, what we're doing in this line here is this. Remember, when you have a set operator, the equal sign, this is your set operator. When you have a set operator, everything on the right side of the set operator gets taken care of first. So we take our total, whatever that happens to be, we add. AI to it. So I, I is coming from this. Our for loop is keeping track of I for us. Each time we just add to what our existing value for the total is. So let's walk through this. And we'll, I'll keep track on the side here what our numbers are. So let's see. Okay. Clean that up a little bit. OK, so I want to keep track of my total. I want to keep track of the i value. 
and then we'll go through and start uh, putting all these together. Okay, so starting here with A, we define our matrix or define our vector. Um, sometimes that'll already be defined. Sometimes you'll have pulled that in from a file, but either way, you have to get your A value in there somehow. Once we have A, we can go through and we can calculate using the length command how many values are there in A. So we figured out N. N is going to be 8 in this case. So uh, I'll just make a note of that here. Uh, for this case, it's going to be 8. There we go. OK, now we've got our 8 set up. Now we get to the next line here. Then we get to our next line. We set the total equal to zero. So coming over here, our total is equal to zero. Okay. Then we then we get to our for loop. So now we're here at our for loop. Okay, so our for loop is going to define i. That's our variable. And that's going to be defined starting at one. One's our beginning. N is our N. So N was 8. So that ends up right here. Okay. So let's start our for loop. So the first time through, I is equal to 1. Then we go into the actual line here. Total equals total plus AI. So the first time through, total is 0. And then A1 since i is equal to 1, a1 is 8. So that's going to be 8. So 0 plus 8 equals 8. And that's what goes into total. So that becomes 8. So that's what things are going to look like the first time through. I want this back. OK. So now our total is equal to 8. OK. Now we get to the end of the for loop. So we're going to go back to the beginning of the for loop. Now i is going to increment. So i is now going to become 2. Then we go through again in our for loop here. So total equals total plus AI. So total currently is 8. A2 is 6. So we're going to do 6 plus 8. That's going to be 14. So now our new total is 14. OK. So now we're going to go through again. We finish the for loop. We loop back again. Now i is going to be 2. I mean 3. i was already 2. So now i is going to be 3. And we're going to go through all this again here. So total is now 14. i is 3. So a i, a 3 is 2. Take that sum. 14 plus 2 is going to be 16. So now our new total is 16. Okay, now we're going to go through again. So we back to the beginning of the for loop. i is going to increment. So the new i value is going to be 4. Okay. So we're going to go again here. So hover red. Okay, so our total is 16. i is 4, so ai is 9. We do 16 plus 9 going to be 25. Okay, so our new total is 25. Okay, now we're going to go through and repeat the for loop again. Okay, so now i is going to be 5. Okay. Let's 
that will not be written. Okay, so our total is 25. I is 5, so we're going to add A5, which is also 25 in this case. 25 plus 25 gives us 50. So now our new total is 50. And we're going to run our loop again. So we're back to the top here. I is going to increment forward. Now I is going to become 6. Now I is 6. We're going to go through the whole thing again. So our total, our total is 50. I is 6, so AI, A6 is 91. So we're going to do 50 plus 91, which is uh, 141. Okay, now we're going to go through the loop again. Now I is going to cycle forward again, so I is going to become 7. And then we go through the process another time. I guess we can repeat a color now. Go back to green. Okay, so our total is 141. I is 7, so A7 is 34. We add these together. We get 141 plus 34. That's 175. So our new total is 175. Okay, now we're going to cycle through again. Back to the top here. Now we cycle I forward again. So the new I value is going to be 8, which is the last value in this case. And now we're going to do this code one more time. So our total is 175. I is 8, so we want A8. That's 56. And the answer there, 175 plus 56, 181 plus 50 is... 231. Okay, so now our total is 231. Now, since there were only eight elements, the for loop stops after we go through the eighth time. So we're done. So now we get to the bottom of our code here. If we wanted to print on the screen, we could do display, uh, display our total. And that would display 231 under the screen. All right, so let's go back onto the, the screen here and we'll I'll type that code out so you can see it um, you know, right in front of you. You can also do an error check on it using a built-in function just to kind of prove that our code works. We've already got our, uh, our array here. We've already figured out the length of it. So those are the first couple of commands here. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to fill in the sum right here. So calculate the sum of the values in the vector A. OK. So here's, here's why the total is always going to be dependent on the loop. Um, we initially set up the total like this. We define the total as zero before we start anything. Um, once we do that, once we get into the loop, it's always going to refer back to that total. So, um, so let's get inside our loop here. Again, we've already defined n right here. So we know what n is. We can get right into our loop. Okay. That's it. Okay. So by setting it up this way, where you have total on both sides of our set operator, so this total equals total construct, what that does is it always refers back to the existing value of total. And then whatever operation we do after that, we modify the value of total, and then save it back into that same variable. 
So the first time through, we set total equal to zero. So the first time we see this, this total is zero, then we add AI to it, which is eight in this case. And then once we do uh, zero plus eight, we figure out the answer for that, which is eight. We save it back into total. So now at the end of the for loop, total is equal to eight. Um, then when it comes back through the next time, total is eight because we saved it under the same variable. So setting, setting up this construct where we have total on both sides of the set operator, this lets our for loop update total however many times we need it to. In this case, it needs to update eight times. Um, if we had a much bigger A matrix, let's say A had 800 numbers in it instead of eight, then this would update total 800 times. So each time it goes to the individual value and then updates total. That way in the end, once we get past this for loop, our total, so the total is zero here, here at the end, our total should be, yeah, 231. So we can print it on the screen here and see that number as we go. Let's do that. Let's, let's run this. We'll print it on the screen and we'll see what that's going to look like. So we can run it. This is kind of messy now because it's got all the things we're running on here. But right here, that's where our total shows up. So you can see our 231. Uh, we could we could use an fprintf statement here instead to make that look a little nicer. So In this case, it's all integers, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. If we run that, now we can maybe see things a little better. Yeah, so here it is. The total of A is 231. So something we could do here, we could also use the built-in MATLAB command to find the total of A, just to be sure that that's correct. We could do sum A. And that should give you a 231 as well. Okay, for the next part, I'm going to have you go ahead and download the data file from the Canvas page if you have not already. So if you go on Canvas and go to in-class stuff, there's a file on there under either October 27 or October 28 called monthlytemp.txt. So I want you to go ahead and download that file and put it in your working directory so that we can work with that. There's going to be an exercise going along with that file as well. Make sure you move the, the file. It's called monthlytemp.txt. Make sure you move it into your, um, your uh, file browser window. So if it's on your desktop, pick it up, grab it, and drop it in there. So that's going to be your current working directory. So here's what we're going to do with that. So I mentioned before, whenever you have a data file, especially if it's a text file, you should open it up and look at it before you try to do anything with it. Kind of see what's in there. So we're going to do that first. So you can open it up in MATLAB, double click it in your uh, current folder window there. And this should show you on your screen what the data file looks like. Um, you can also look at it in things like Notepad. I wouldn't open anything in Word typically. So you can see our data file. We can see that it's all numbers. So it's got two columns. The first column is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The second column is a bunch of numbers that are in the range of about 110 up to uh, 377, 378, somewhere in that range. So we got numbers that are in the hundreds in one column, and we've got numbers that are 1 through 12 in the other column. So we can start making some deductions here. Uh, we can deduce from the name of the file, monthly temp, that 
one through twelve on the in the left column is the is the months because there's twelve months in a year. So we've got two years of data here with a monthly temperature. We can assume temp is temperature. And then we can look at the numbers and start asking some questions about what kind of temperature is this. So um, these don't look like any kind of uh, temperatures that we might normally see on a thermometer. So maybe they're in Kelvin. So we'll go ahead with that assumption. Um, we'll evaluate the validity of that assumption later. But let's assume these are Kelvin temperatures. Okay. So we can also see that we have uh, 24 rows and it's all numbers, no labels. So now we can start thinking about how we might want to um, read this file. Load command is going to be the easiest way to do this. Um, you could also use import data. You would be buying yourself a little more effort, I think, but I think the load command is just fine. So if we run this now, hit the run button, and you look in your workspace, you should have a variable called monthly temp that should be a 24 by 2 uh, double, is what it should say in your workspace. So we can check and see what it is. And it's important to do this, just make sure that your data looks like it's supposed to. And it should look like what was in the data file before, and it does. So we're off to a good start here. So we've kind of walked through that stuff before. I just It's good to review what to do with your data file. Um, now what we want to do is for now we don't really care too much about these month values here. What we really care about is the data. So we want to extract the just the data column into its own um, own array. And that's where you come in. So uh, make sure you go to the Canvas page and visit the assignments page for the in-class activity associated with this lecture.